So as soon as we came back from PAX, that was when, like, even on the ride home from PAX, I was like, I've, I've got to design a game. I've got to make a game. And, you know, our friend was as well. It was just like, yeah. this is totally accessible to we me. We were now. designing a game on the way down a little bit, too. That's true, Lumberjacks. <laughs> but, I, I don't know, that was just the atmosphere at the convention was, anybody can make games. Go make mm. a game. Go make one that, you know, this was Vincent Baker's thing, was that, go make a terrible game that sucks, and then go make another one that's slightly better, and then eventually yeah. you'll make a good one. Yeah. I like that advice. He's a brilliant guy, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. The advice he gives is, is just fantastic. <laughs> but yeah, like, there's the Indie Games booth there, mm -hmm. uh, that they're, uh, what is it, the Indie Games Bazaar, they call themselves. Yeah. And Bizarre. they're all really like, hey, try this thing out, do these wonderful things, and they're very fun people. Yeah. Uh, who is it? Uh, Epidia Ravichel is also a lot of fun to talk to whenever you're there. Yeah. Uh, creator of Dread. I had I had a fantastic time geeking out with Meg Baker. That was my favorite oh, part. Oh yeah. We're kind of both doing like, you know, May, talking Meg's a fantastic everything. lady. She's a lot of fun. But yeah, the whole the whole everything about that con was just encouraging and inspiring for me. So yeah. as soon as I got back, I was like, let's make games. It was like a week or so later that we kind of all met for tea and, and game design, which yeah, is exactly. Which fun. Maybe, so maybe even more than a week later, because I think it took us a while to get our schedules together. Yeah. But that's yeah, also that's great that you guys have done some stuff there. Uh, I did something for Game Chef this year that was a lot of fun. Yeah, that turned out so great. I should yeah, I, I had a newer version that I actually don't... I don't remember if you read the newer one, but mm -hmm. I, I didn't get a nomination, but it was the first game I ever wrote. You no, know? I, that's amazing. And now, again, like you have something that's down, and now, mm -hmm. you know, what's yeah. to stop you from making all kinds of stuff? Yeah, that's true. Uh, and especially with nano games nowadays, people are getting into that. Yeah, actually, exactly. It feels more accessible. For those unaware, nano games are games written usually under six or seven hundred words. They're really, really short games. Like fit on a business card type deal. That's where the first one came from. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, but yeah, there were two nano games for 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 the contest this year. One I think was 174 me. words. Man, that is concise. Yeah. I love it. It's more like a tool for like creating an experience. Yeah, exactly. It's really cool. Well, I mean, you have to compare that to you know at one time an RPG book was this thing that was like this big well, and it was hardbound and then well yeah exactly yeah. 70s but you had to have 10 supplements. You know, oh like yeah! How inaccessible would that would that have been if you were looking at games in like the mid '90s or whatever? Yeah, it's if, just like this is a thing made by a company. It's true. If, a if you team look at everything designers. that way, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But really, now. people can create their own thing, and it, and you could have a play time for your game of 15 minutes. Yeah. The parsley games, the uh, the action castles, stuff like that, are designed that way. <laughs> and those are fun. Those are they, they are fun, and it's fun. a brilliant idea. And that's really what it comes down to: have a brilliant idea and throw it out there. Another great bit of advice that I heard at PAX was like. Don't worry about wasting your your best idea on a game that isn't going to be very good early on, yeah. because you're going to have new and better ideas later. Yeah, well that's just a matter of, with any kind of design or anything that you're doing, you have to have some faith that you don't have one good idea and then you're just, you're barren for the you're rest yeah. forever. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so for years people have said in gaming that rule zero is that the GM is always right, or that the uh, GM can make a rules change at any given time. You know, they, they are secondary to the story. And I've heard Joshua A.C. Newman say much better. It was at the first year I went to PAX, I went to a panel, and somebody from the audience piped up with the comment that if there's a disagreement between the rules and the story, the, the story should always win. And Joshua just did miss a beat. He says to the guy, if there's a disagreement between the rules and the story, why are you playing that game? Why are you playing a game where the rules would do that? I actually, and we were discussing this before, the concept of rule zero and the GM always being right can be as much a detriment to gaming as it is a boon. Like, yes, yeah. it lets you push past things, but it also gives one person a lot of control to push their agenda and yeah. a lot of ability to, like, mess with the players, not not just their, their well, agency, but also, yeah. like, what they feel they can trust about the world. The idea of the GM is always right, is for the sake of ending arguments very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. You say, I don't want my game to get bogged down in a bunch of arguments, I want someone to just be able to say this or that and end it. But I think if you have one person who's in control of the whole thing, mm -hmm. and everyone else just has to follow along with whatever rules they decide, that's kind of where conflicts come from. Yeah, <laughs> which you know? we can't argue that they exist because there is a huge amount of advice 
for gaming groups and it's kind yeah. of like Dear Abby for gamers <laughs> because they're almost all social issues yes. and many of them could possibly be resolved if there was a little bit more of a fair social contract going on. Not all of them necessarily, you yeah. know. There, there is probably a better rule zero there, but I'm going to cover another one first. Okay. And that is the concept of genre being rule zero, which okay. I've heard before. And it, there's some value to that. It's the idea that we should push the idea of what we're playing to do yeah. first. It, it's a little bit related, but not really. It, it definitely doesn't give all the power to one person. It kind of gives the yeah. power to the feeling that you're trying to get out of play. Yeah, well, the idea is that you have some sort of like vague creative notion that you can appeal to, but I don't really see that as like a conflict ending thing because someone can just be, can, can just say, oh, well, you know, in a, in a Conan type story, it would obviously go this way, and someone else would say, no way, man, Conan would never do that. There would be this or that. Yes. I don't know. It doesn't sound that useful to me. As far as I'm concerned, a rule zero means something that is fundamental and that that is above all other rules and should just be at the base of everything you play. So yeah. my rule zero is don't be a jerk. Yeah, and I remember you saying that. I'm like, that really should be what people consider rule yeah, zero to be. Exactly. I don't imagine people will actually all go out and be like, okay, let's just all make this adjustment across the board through the <laughs> hobby. But it's, it's a good thing to keep in mind that, yeah. you know, people can just do better and we might not have as much, again, necess need for people to like, look for advice for how to do a better with their gaming group if exactly. people were being nicer to each other. Yeah. And well, and if everyone at the table is not being a jerk, if they're all kind of going with that, chances are you're having a good time. Your players are having a good time. Like, yeah. that it's, just always kind of works. It's great to have fun. It's, it's, a, it's also great to be around other people having fun as well. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I ran into a little while back, there was some discussion about what you wouldn't do. Like, what type oh. of game would you not play? What would you not do in a, in a game yeah. session? And... As you've seen, I'm kind of open to what a lot of people would never play. Yeah. Like I, I don't really let you know. Uh, I, I don't really let sensibilities get in the way of uh, things. I kind of mm -hmm. like to push boundaries a little bit. But I did have an answer for this. Like, yeah, there's one or two games out there that I've heard of. Probably wouldn't be for me. Flower for Mara. Flower for Mara. Flower for Mara. Uh, yeah, that that that's kind of a group therapy yeah. game. Uh, that's really, really nasty. There's another one too that I don't, don't really want to bring up. It's a uh, Nordic LARP. Oh, yeah. yeah. I know what you're talking about. I would uh, pass. But, you know, there is value to those games. I'm not going to say that they're worthless, but yeah. uh, they're just not for me. Yeah. But the big thing that I said was I would never want to play a game where me having fun meant that the person beside me wouldn't have fun. Yep. You know, the, the I'm going to do this because it's awesome for me, and then I'm going to destroy everybody else's yeah. experience. And, like, I think you can play a competitive game. There are lots of good competitive games. Oh, yeah, but there's but, competitive games that, where your competitiveness makes the game better. Exactly. You're supposed to... The idea of, of having a group game be competitive is that it adds some kind of impetus for people to do stuff, right? And and you're inspired to do better or work harder based on what other yeah. people are doing. Fiasco is a great example. Exactly. You're all trying to do something, but it's for the sake of making a wackier and more like ridiculous yeah. story. I mean, we've had so many sessions of Fiasco where one person is being a complete dick in character to the person yeah. beside them, and it's a fun scene for both of them. Exactly, because the other person's trying not to laugh while this person's, you know. Yeah, they're they're feeding off of it. It's, yeah. it's, it's great. And there are other games where that that's not on the table. It's not the social contract and that doesn't make the game fun for people yeah it's kind of almost a sociopathic behavior to not care about the people that are your friends at the table yeah. because what you want is getting pushed forward in the moment people might get a little bit you know to this is my scene kind of a thing yeah but it's the important thing is that after that scene you take a moment and be like okay i really want to like put the spotlight on other people now and yeah. like give other people their chance yeah. to shine if, if you're putting your fun over everyone else's you're being a jerk so rule zero is broken but also it's i don't know why you're playing a group game if you don't care that everybody else has fun you That's know, like, point. go play a video game. <laughs> and there, or play one of the, the games that are designed for one player and one GM. That might be perfect for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're in the spotlight ghosts. all the time. Yeah, <laughs> murderous ghosts of all games. Be murdered by ghosts. You'll be... You'll be it, exactly. <laughs> Immersion play was never really intended to go on forever. I, I know some people go that route with videos. Uh, the one, one of the things that you run into whenever you decide to... Uh, come up with more of an educational tone, I don't really want to say educational, but just sort of like sharing knowledge and ideas, is that if you pick something specific as I have with game theory, you're going to run into a problem at a certain point, where one, for example, I only know so much about game theory, and I've been learning it a lot as I went. So eventually, I run out of things that I can speak of 
intelligently and have with it be, authority and exactly and have it be worth somebody to listen to right so either at a certain point I looked at my videos and went either at a certain point my quality is either gonna tank uh, I'm going to have to spend a lot of more time researching topics which would mean that I'd have to drop to maybe a monthly uh, release schedule yeah or uh, I would have to change the topic entirely or you'd retread old conversations That's old topics too. by accident so. right so I kind of decided okay at a certain point I'm gonna let the series come to its own natural conclusion and I like how that worked out I like that I managed to get some of the major theories in right before the end mm -hmm. uh, and I did of course save uh, emergent properties for the last because it's yeah. my favorite topic about gaming I think they're fantastically interesting yeah absolutely but there's definitely more to say and it's Clearly, from the response I've gotten, there are some people in the community that are very interested in the types of games that I've discussed and the type of theory that I've discussed. Yeah, and so really, it's this isn't a conversation that has to end just because one channel is ending. This is something that anyone can take up. Um, it's it's a conversation that all gamers have around their gaming tables when they're just talking before a game. Mm -hmm. It's mostly, it, mostly it provides a lot of the language that was more helpful to understanding games and just yeah. cluing people into what the, the overall concepts are and, and kind of a way to think. And uh, defining yeah. things that you are already doing that you might not have realized there are words to express. Yeah, Bleed is a great example Absolutely, of that. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, but also emergent properties, so we kind of understand that. And also there's just, just a matter of thinking of things in broader terms and just kind of seeing where you know, a problem or a good thing or a bad thing about games might be. Yeah, and examining that and having a conversation about it. Absolutely. It's it's something that I, I would very much like to see other people follow up after me. It'd be great to see other channels uh, take on this idea or new ones pop up. And also within the community of people who enjoy the types of games I've been talking about, it'd be great to have more content out there for them. Yeah, we, we, we really noticed a dearth of um, YouTube channels discussing both game theory as well as the games that exist outside of uh, perhaps more traditional or large publishing games. Uh, small press games, indie games, uh, story games, whatever you want to call them, are they are legion. There, there, there are, are so many and there's there's something out there for everyone. Yeah. Um, and they explore so many different themes and concepts and each of them seem to uh, approach theory. Uh, it's just a fantastic way for people to engage with our one of our favorite hobbies. Exactly. Um, a lot of people have, for a long time have wanted to create their own games. Yeah. And it's, there's a lot of resources out there to make that easy for people. Mm -hmm. And there's communities of people helping each other out. And that's just it. So what we, we really don't want to see this as being one of the only or the only channel talking about that. Mm -hmm. It's it's up to people out there. If you have an interest in it, share that interest. And we guarantee you that a community will form just as it has for Emergent Play. I hope you've enjoyed our epilogue to Emergent Play. I'd like to say thank you for watching, and from all of us, I, we hope that your next game is even better than your last.